Well, this is a, probably a loaded question given the nature of the <laughs> webinar today. Uh, but I want you to think about that, the leading cause of accidental death in adults in America. <clears throat> and the reason I think that's important is because up until recently it was car accidents. Uh, and with the opiate epidemic fueling accidental drug overdose, uh, that is now the, the number one cause of accidental death in America every 20 minutes. Um, by the time we get done with this webinar, three people will have had fatal overdoses uh, in the country. Um, so what an overdose does, the actual physiology of it, is uh, when you intake opiates, uh, it, the opiate receptors in the brain are filled. Uh, there are a lot of uh, effects from that. One is euphoria. Uh, another is that you have depressed breathing. Uh, so the more of the drug you take, the more euphoria you get, but also the more your breathing becomes depressed um, to the point where you're actually not able to sustain life. Uh, so more than five minutes of not breathing can lead to permanent brain damage uh, and fatal overdose. There are a lot of ways to identify an overdose. Uh, you can, you know, we can look through this list and see, oh, the skin will be blue or the lips turn gray. But really what we're going to do uh, in an emergency situation is we are going to walk over to the person. And you see in the picture on the top there, it's called a sternal rub. You're going to take your knuckles as hard as you can and rub it on the sternum. Uh, if for some reason they have a thick winter jacket on or you can't get to the sternum, you can do it on the top lip, uh, so right where the gums meet the bottom of the nose. You just take your fist and very, very hard uh, rub it on there. If they don't respond to that, uh, for all intents and purposes, they have uh, overdosed. Um, so, so while I put a big list on here, uh, what EMT do and what we suggest uh, lay people do is just immediately do a sternal rub. Um, Rescue breathing during an opiate overdose can save a life is perhaps the most important thing that we teach. Um, again, when people overdose, it's not that uh, their organs shut down, it's, uh, it's that they're not getting enough oxygen to their brain. So immediately administering rescue breaths uh, can really be the difference between uh, tragedy and, and a life saved. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later in the in the webinar. Uh, what is naloxone? Uh, naloxone has one purpose. It can't be abused. Uh, it has no euphoric effects. Uh, it, it literally only reverses overdoses. So there's no street value for it. Uh, there's no diversion value for it. Uh, it has one purpose. Um, and that is to save people's lives. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as Narcan. That's just the brand name uh, for it. Uh, to let you know, uh, as, as people in the community, you are legally protected when administering naloxone. Uh, the law, SB 227, Aaron's Law, um, has provided a couple things. Uh, one is that no special certification is needed for Indiana lay people to carry and administer naloxone. Uh, the reason for that is because it is so incredibly safe uh, and so easy to use. Uh, and then Section 9 further states that lay people are immune from civil liability for acts or omissions when administering the drug. Uh, and this is comprehensive. You have to, in order to have, there would have to be gross negligence um, in order to have any type of liability. And we've been assured by the senators who have pushed this bill through uh, that there, there really is no liability um, in administering it. So how does naloxone work? Uh, as I said, when uh, a person does opiates, those opiates attach to the opiate receptors. Uh, naloxone is an antagonist. It also uh, wants to go for those opiate receptors. It has a stronger affinity than, than the opiates. So when it reaches those receptors, it actually kicks the opiates out of the receptors. Uh, that doesn't mean the opiates are neutralized. That just means they're in the brain uh, and they are floating around waiting right, for, uh, for receptors to attach to. Uh, after about 90 minutes, the naloxone starts to wear off and the opiates reattach. Uh, but in those 90 minutes, you uh, get a breathing space, literal breathing space, right, uh, where 
uh, enough opiates are kicked out of those opiate receptors so that breathing is no longer depressed. Um, another effect of that is the euphoria is taken away. So oftentimes, if you administer naloxone, people will experience withdrawal symptoms. Typically, what that looks like, it's not like the movies uh, where people you know, come out swinging. Uh, it's, it's like, imagine waking up confused as to where you were uh, and with the onset of a flu. That's a, a pretty typical description. Uh, there are a lot of ways to administer the naloxone. Uh, intravenously is the fastest. Obviously, in libraries, we're not going to be hooking up uh, intravenous <laughs> naloxone drips. Uh, intermuscular is the next fastest, and then subcutaneous uh, is the slowest. Uh, and subcutaneous can be um, what's known as skin popping, or it could be, uh, well, I guess a, another one that we're going to talk about is uh, through the nasal membrane. Uh, but naloxone also works on all opiates. Uh, I'm not sure if the slide is on here, uh, but you're not going to have to worry about being able to identify opiates. Uh, if you walk in uh, to, say, the bathroom and somebody is not responding to the sternal rub, you're just going to assume that there was an opiate overdose. You don't actually have to know anything about opiates uh, because, again, the naloxone is safe. Uh, it can be administered. It's never been shown to interact with any other drugs uh, in a negative way. So we're just going to suppose that it is always an uh, opiate overdose. Uh, so there are some different forms of naloxone. Uh, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner the Evzio auto-injector. Uh, it's much like an EpiPen. It talks through. Uh, and then you'll see the intramuscular uh, syringe-based naloxone and the nasal spray Narcan. And I'm not sure what type of naloxone the libraries will have. Um, and that's really going to be up to any institution to decide if it actually has the numbers that the Secretary sure. of the Chain is referencing. Uh, today, mm. I only know of one library in the state that currently has actually used the hard stop method um, to administer naloxone. Um, and that's really just a discussion that the administrators and the libraries are and we'll go over briefly how to how to use each one, uh, but they come with instructions, and that's something. It's, again, it's very simple. Um, so very likely you would get the auto injectors or the nasal spray. Uh, so again, naloxone only works on opiates. Uh, quick list of uh, what are opiates and what are not opiates. And I'll, and I'm going to repeat this again. So you're going to use that naloxone even if you aren't sure if opiates are involved. So you walk in and you smell alcohol and you're pretty sure it's alcohol, uh, go ahead and administer the naloxone anyway. Again, it's harmless. It only works on opiates. It doesn't interact with any other uh, drug. The, the measure of its safety uh, can be, I guess, known in the fact that it's used uh, post-birth. So if uh, too much sedative is administered to the mother, um, Sometimes uh, the child will be delivered and will uh, have overdose, and the naloxone is immediately administered uh, to, to uh, get the child breathing again. Um, again, it's not known to interact with other drugs. It's been around a long time. It was invented in 1961. It was FDA approved in 1971. Um, there's, as I said before, no potential for abuse, uh, and you could say, I, I could say, sometimes I'll drink it. You can't see me, but imagine that I just drank some, just to show you how safe it was. And you, not only is it safe, but here, here are some uh, ideas for actually keeping it safe. Uh, depending on, on what type of naloxone you get, basically the rule of thumb is treat it like you would a pet, right? You wouldn't leave your pet in the car uh, if it was over a certain temperature. You wouldn't leave your pet in the car if it was below freezing. Uh, notice the expiration date uh, and, and keep it out of sunlight. The uh, exposure to sunlight is actually the most detrimental environmental effect on naloxone. So if we can keep that in the box, uh, it's going to be in pretty good shape. And now I'm going to throw this out there. If for some reason you did leave it in the car, uh, go ahead and administer it anyway. It's not going to go bad. All that happens is the efficacy is decreased. Uh, so if it's expired, uh, I personally uh, would go ahead and administer it anyway. We can't give it out after expiration date, but much like milk, we know that uh, 
the expiration date on the bottle is not quite accurate. Um, so what to do in case of an OD? Here's the actual nuts and bolts of, of what would happen uh, were I to walk into, again, uh, the bathroom at the library uh, and find somebody um, on the floor. Uh, I would walk over, uh, stimulate, I would call 911, I would clear their airway, do rescue breathing, evaluate if naloxone would help, medicate them with the naloxone, and then evaluate and support. We'll go through these one by one. Uh, so scare me. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is stimulate. Again, uh, can they be awakened? Are they responsive to external stimulus? So uh, I might yell at them. Uh, I might slap them. Uh, but most likely, I'm going to do a sternal rub. Uh, it's the easiest and most effective way. If they don't respond to that, uh, I'm going to ask somebody to call for help if the person's not responsive and have them call 911. Um, typically what we'll say is, uh, the, you know, when we call 911, is the person's not responding or the person's not breathing. Uh, after somebody has called 911, uh, I'm, I'm going to clear their airway, right? So a, the A and B of life are airway and, and breathing. Um, so I'm going to roll them on their back tilt their head, clear their airway, and pinch their nose. Uh, this is uh, similar to CPR. Uh, when they train in CPR these days, they tell you actually not to do rescue breathing. Um, since this isn't a cardiac emergency, we're telling you the exact opposite. Um, so you are not going to do CPR unless, of course, they don't have a heartbeat, uh, and you are only going to do rescue breathing. Uh, because, again, to, to repeat, the, uh, the problem is, is that the person is not getting oxygen. So if we can just keep oxygen uh, going in their body, uh, we can cause, uh, we can decrease the, the chance of fatality or permanent damage. Um, so the way we're going to do that is, uh, so I have rolled them on their back, tilted their head back, cleared out the airway, and pinched their nose. I'm going to give two quick breaths, and then... Uh, one big breath every five to seven seconds afterwards. Um, one thing to be aware of uh, in doing rescue breathing is that you want to make sure the chest rises and falls. If you don't have the head tilted back far enough, uh, you can fill their stomach up with air. Uh, and you will notice that because the stomach doesn't fall uh, once it's been filled up with air. And eventually the person uh, will very likely throw up. So it's just uh, something to think about. Keep your eye on the chest, make sure it's rising and falling. Uh, and, and again, you're not doing CPR, you're just doing rescue breathing. The reason we keep stressing this is because uh, oftentimes, even if you don't have naloxone, you can save the person's life simply by administering rescue breath. Uh, so the next thing that would happen is uh, I've been doing the rescue breathing. Uh, if they become conscious, or if they are breathing enough to sustain life, um, perhaps they don't need naloxone. Um, maybe the naloxone is uh, too far away for me to, to get, and it would be better for me to stay and do rescue breathing. Those are the type of things we're going to be thinking about when we're evaluating. Uh, and then the next is if they do actually need the naloxone, I am going to uh, administer that medication. Uh, so I will... Uh, with the auto injector, I'm, I'm going to pull the device from the case and follow the voice directions, very easy. Um, with the nasal, I will assemble the atomizer and naloxone vial per the directions and then spray half in each nostril or nair. Uh, and then with the nasal, I'll spray the entire dose into one nostril. We'll go through those really quickly. So while I'm not going to train you on each individual type of administration, uh, as you see here, it's pretty simple. Um, with the injector, you're going to put them the injector either on their arm, their buttock, or their thigh. And these are very easy. The unfortunate part of the auto injectors uh, is that it's $4,200 uh, cost if you pay out of pocket. Uh, these are very common among EMT and first responders and police. Uh, these are the nasal. You have to do some assembly with them. Um, and these are what we, these are really would be the easiest for uh, libraries to purchase and to use. Um, 
again, I won't go through all the details of these. I'm not sure which Narcan you might be using, uh, but the instructions are there. It really is incredibly easy. Uh, as you see with this version, you literally just put it in the person's nose and squeeze a button. Um, so uh, finally, hopefully 911 will be on the way by then. Um, but then after I've administered the naloxone, I'm gonna uh, check, is the person breathing on their own? Uh, do they need another dose? Um, if they do come out of it, uh, they'll, they'll, like I said, they'll feel like they have the onset of a flu. Uh, they'll be confused. So typically what we tell people is, uh, you know, just softly and gently, and I know it's, sometimes it's very emotional to have this happen, uh, but softly and gently tell them what happened, uh, that they overdosed, that you administered naloxone. Um, typically they'll start feeling better in about 15 minutes to a half an hour. Um, after, after about 90 minutes, the naloxone uh, will have completely worn off. Um, so the overdose can come back uh, on long-acting opioids. Now, again, in your situation, you won't have the person there for that long. By that time, uh, 911 will have, have gotten there uh, to take care of the person. But we want to support them and, and stop them from using again, uh, for sure, uh, until 911 gets there. Um, and uh, keeping them in the recovery position to uh, prevent aspiration. So if they, for some reason, are nauseous uh, or, or vomit, uh, that they're in the recovery position, they're on their side. And, uh, there's a nice picture of the recovery position. And then uh, when they come out, uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of people think that when they come out, they come out swinging. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it used to be that emergency rooms used a higher concentration of naloxone. Uh, so that was the case, that people would come out very upset uh, and, and extremely ill. Uh, we use a much different, and, and you would use a, a much uh, more gentle concentration. Uh, so there's very few people who report vomiting. Uh, as I said, it, it wears off in 30 or four minutes, 30 or 40 minutes, and it's uh, much more gentle uh, coming out. So uh, the final things to think about um, when you are supporting them in the end is, uh, again, uh, help them, explain to them what happened. Um, if they're not coming around and 911's not there, uh, administer more naloxone. Uh, so if, if after two or three minutes the person has not revived, uh, you're going to administer more naloxone. It's, again, it's not going to hurt them. You could administer seven, eight, 10, 15, 100 shots, uh, and it's not going to hurt them. Uh, after an hour, are they getting sleepy again? After an hour, they won't be on library property anymore, uh, very likely, so you're not going to have to worry about that. If it was a, a, in a different situation, though, uh, they might need another dose of naloxone. And uh, if it were, say, a friend or family member and uh, it weren't possible to call 911, you would just stay with them and keep a close eye on them. So a quick review of what we just went over. I walk into the bathroom. I see somebody on the floor. I stimulate with a sternal rub. I call 911 clear their airway, administer uh, rescue breathing. Um, if they don't respond to that, I uh, administer the medication, and then I'm going to evaluate and support until 911 shows up. Um, there are a lot of ways to get naloxone. Uh, while we couldn't supply every library in the state with naloxone because of a, a limited supply, um, we can uh, help sometimes. So contacting us at the IndianaRecoveryAlliance.org. Um, Overdose Lifeline out of Indianapolis also covers uh, the state and is allowed to distribute naloxone. Uh, their website is also listed. Um, Indiana State Department of Health has a web page called Opt-in, and you can go to that and actually they have an interactive map where you can click and find out uh, who is closest to you on ways to obtain naloxone. And then stores such as Lucky's Market, uh, CVS, and Walgreens. And you can get that without a prescription. You just walk in and say that you would like naloxone. Uh, no question, should be no questions asked. Um, and you can use your insurance to pay for that. Again, no questions asked. Uh, so here's some contact information for the Indiana Recovery Alliance. Um, and then we finally ask you again, uh, given the situation, oftentimes, uh, 
people who use drugs are uh, not necessarily treated very nicely. Um, so uh, we hope that, that within the context of our opiate epidemic that we're currently experiencing and understanding that uh, many people who are using drugs uh, are desperately um, trying to, to not, desperately trying to get their lives back, and they're finding that these um, very high-powered sedatives have uh, overtaken their lives and, and have become such an enormous problem uh, that they literally find themselves uh, unable to stop. The, uh, the definition of severe substance use disorder is the inability to stop despite negative consequences. So what for you and I might be a consequence more than sufficient to stop us from engaging in certain behaviors uh, doesn't work for people uh, with severe substance use disorder. So, and you know, being nice is saving somebody's life. So, uh, and that is all I have. So we had a few questions for you, Jeff. Um, with Frazier, this is uh, the first one is going, is there a limit on the amount that a treatment patient can purchase? Yeah, there's no limit on the amount of naloxone you can purchase. Um, for an individual, there might be a limit on what your insurance will pay for, um, but yeah, there's there's uh, you could go in every day and and get more naloxone uh, through the pharmacy. And do you know if there are currently any programs that offer clinics available that might be able to subsidize the cost of treatment for these patients that are using opioids? Uh, so your local health departments might be able to help. There was recently some money given out by, uh, and naloxone given out by the Indiana State Department of Health. So contacting your local health departments if they were recipients of those grants. Uh, again, Overdose Lifeline uh, received a grant from the Attorney General's office uh, and could very likely uh, assist you in obtaining the naloxone. Um, yeah, those are a couple of options. Um, so I see that a couple of people have requested um, that we go over a few of the guidelines and also um, back up to show the contact websites again. I have a few more slides in the presentation, um, and then we can scale back and we can cover any information that you guys have needed. Just to remind everybody, um, at the end of all the meetings, there's a copy of the slide deck, which has all the contact information for your workers' websites as well. Um, but we just have a few more things to go over. So, um, as I mentioned previously, there's the Overdose Lifeline. Uh, this is an organization that provides educational programming, uh, both to students as well as seniors. Those tend to be the two groups that they target. Um, for students, it's preventative, where they generally are scheduled within school. And then for senior citizens, um, it's more about managing conditions. Um, so they like to focus on seniors um, mainly because these are the people that tend to be caregivers of grandchildren or are more likely to have children who have family struggles with addiction. Um, so it's more about intervention and actually being able to respond if there is an issue for the caregivers. Um, and those sorts of programs, if you're interested in providing that uh, to your patrons, uh, you can reach out to them. I have a slide from, from the Overdose Lifeline that kind of goes, gives a general summary of some of the uh, training that they offer to students. Um, they're very short kind of trainings that are available 45 minutes to 60 minutes in length. Um, and they, they did receive a, a, a grant from the Indian State Government Department of Health um, to kind of fund some of these trainings. And again, when everybody receives the slide deck, there will be contact information for their educational outreach coordinator. Um, please reach out to her if you'd like her to do any kind of presentation on your own library. So I think that previously uh, we had requests for the contact information. Everybody will receive a copy of the slide deck with that. Um, but specifically about the sternum rub, uh, Monica, did you need to clarify? Would you just like to see the images again? Or um, was there something about the process of administering the sternum rub that you wanted me to recall? Well, I'll go over it uh, quickly. So usually I do these uh, live, not through webinar. Um, 
So I will take that into consideration if we do another webinar to have a, a better presentation on the sternal rub. Uh, but the basic of it is this, if you could uh, just make a fist. So you have a fist now. And now if you take it and <clears throat> just below the throat, maybe two inches below the throat is the sternum. And you're going to take your knuckles and vigorously r rub your knuckles. Um, are you still connected? You're going to vigorously rub your knuckles on the sternum. Now that hurts, uh, and and uh, any person who is even remotely conscious is going to uh, to tell you to stop doing that. Um, so the reason we do that is because it does hurt, and it's a very very quick way to. Um, do you see the person again on the top uh, in the picture that we're showing where they've placed their fist? So again, they're just vigorously rubbing the sternum. Um, and, and, and again, to a person who is uh, not overdosed, uh, they're going to respond to that type of painful external stimulus. So did anybody else have any questions for the, any more questions for the presenter? I think I had mentioned previously uh, today I can only confirm um, one library in the state that has trained frontline staff to actually administer naloxone. Um, if anybody's curious in talking to them, please feel free to send me an email and I can try to put you in contact with them uh, just to see about how they got that process started. Um, I also know of additional libraries outside of the state of Indiana. Um, some who claim that they have saved multiple patrons' lives. Uh, by being trained to administer naloxone. And if the Monroe County Library officials are listening, they can just come downstairs right now, and uh, we'll be glad to give them naloxone later in the day. So, uh, Rachel was curious to know, how can you tell the difference between someone who has a heart attack, a stroke, or a brain injury? Uh, well, with a heart attack, they're not going to be unresponsive. Uh, and with a stroke, I believe the acronym is FAST. So you're going to look for a facial droop. Ooh, I, I'm unprepared to answer this question as far as strokes. Um, but but the what you're going to notice, again, with an overdose is uh, is them not, not moving, right? So very little movement uh, and no responsiveness. Um, as opposed to a heart attack or a stroke where somebody can actually be up and, and appear functional um, for days even. Now if there was uh, some confusion and for some reason the person wasn't moving or wasn't responding and you didn't know what the difference was, you're going to do the same thing anyway. You'll administer the naloxone and call 911. Do we have any other questions for Chris today? So um, I, again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, and everybody will be receiving a copy of the slides, as well as a link to the recording of the audio for the presentation. I hope everybody has a great day. Yeah, thank you all.